name is Camille Nebaker. I'm the director of the research ethics program at UC San Diego. And today I have the pleasure of introducing a speaker of ours from the computer science and engineering department, Tahita Roman. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Tahita in just a minute. But what I wanted to um, talk a little bit about before we get started is the research ethics program, which is a campus resource that provides education to our entire campus community on scientific ethics and, and responsible and ethical research practices. We also do consultation for the campus. And so when folks are having challenges around data management or lab management or authorship decisions, we consult with our community and help navigate some of the trickier situations that come about in the area of research. And one of the things that we really are striving to do as part of this community is foster an environment where we can have conversations about the ethical, legal, and social impacts of our work. And so, you know, oftentimes when I use the term research ethics, people immediately think of human research protections and an IRB and getting regulatory compliance approval. But what we're doing is so much more challenging than that. And especially in this era of digital health and artificial intelligence and the new kinds of ethical challenges that are being introduced, we're constantly working with our research community, but not to solve problems. We're looking to try to anticipate downstream issues and work together as a community so that we can start working together to solve these problems and not only you know, try to navigate, but also how should we be shaping ethical practices as we work in this area of digital health and artificial intelligence. And uh, with that, in August, back, actually back in July of 2023, we decided to start cultivating conversations as a, as a mechanism to introduce our research community to one another. And we decided to focus on digital health and artificial intelligence in the health context because it's such a fast growing emerging area. And we really do have quite a presence here at UC San Diego in this area. And so our goal was to bring together researchers who could share their exciting work, but also elevate awareness of some of the ethical issues that they've had to address, how they've navigated them, some solutions that they've identified. And that way we can work together to help each other out. And through these kinds of cultivating conversation seminars, I, I think our speakers have also found resources at UC San Diego that they didn't know exist, like support for data management and, and things like that. So with that background, I now want to introduce Tahita Rahman, who is an assistant professor in the Hala, I just wrote this down. You're going to have to help me. Dr. Raman. Uh, ha Halijulu. Halijulu Data Science yeah. Institute. Thank you. At the <laughs> University of California, San Diego, he directs the mobile sensing and ubiquitous computing lab called Mosaic. His current research focuses on building unique uh, and ubiquitous mobile health sensing technologies that capture observable low level physical signals in the form of acoustic and electromagnetic waves. I am, um, he, he is quite an accomplished scholar. He has an amazing background that is in his bio. So I'm not gonna repeat all that, but I would like to turn it over to you, Dr. Raman, and, and ask you to uh, share your research with us. And if everyone who is attending um, you know, we're a small group, so feel free to turn on your camera. And also, we will have some time for Q&A at the end, um, probably about 10 minutes. So with mm -hmm. that, I'll turn it on over to you to share your slides. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can turn. All right. Yeah, once again, thank you so much, uh, Camille, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's a great honor and privilege. I have, I have, we have been discussing and have been planning it for a while and I'm really, really glad that I, we could make it happen. I'd love to, as, as I said, I'd love to engage uh, in once the situation becomes different, I'd love to engage in person meetings and uh, discussions in the future as well. All right, so once again, my name is Tauhidur Rahman. Um, I'm still professor in the Halijuli Data Science Institute as well as Computer Science Engineering. Um, and I'm director, as Camille mentioned, director of Mosaic Lab, Mobile Sensing and Ubiquitous Computing Lab. Uh, I'm actually a rec relatively recent hire. Um, I moved here in San Diego in 2022, end of 2022, 2022 I think September 2022. Uh, before that, I was a faculty member, um, assistant professor 
uh, at University of Massachusetts Amherst in the computer science department. And before that, I uh, completed my PhD uh, graduate studies from Cornell University. Um, so today, today I'm going to talk about uh, harnessing health signals with large scale mobile sensor data. And I'm going to talk you, uh, kind of present a couple of applications, almost like a buffet style, right? Uh, a little bit of here and that, but I'm, I'm going to primarily try to focus on the ethical issue. Uh, but please uh, uh, be mindful that I that is not my core expertise, and that is where I would love to find collaboration opportunities with many of you. And in terms of application area, I'm going to focus on opioid addiction, mental health, as well as infectious diseases. All right, so all right, let's talk about mobile sensor data first. Uh, thanks to the ubiquity of mobile uh, devices. And thanks to the availability of wide range of mobile sensors and many of these mobile devices that we all carry uh, and have around us, like smartphones and uh, wearables, uh, we have observed a remarkable growth and expansion uh, of many of these mobile sensor data systems in the digital health space. Uh, in fact, uh, recent evidence, both coming out of uh, industry and academia, are all pointing out to the fact that mobile sensor data can fundamentally enable next generation healthcare by redefining how we monitor health condition, how we track effects of treatment, detect incidence of diseases, and also trigger just-in-time health interventions. Now the question is, what is behind, behind this resounding success of mobile sensor data, right? And if you look for the answer, what we found is really this mobile sensor data enable digital biomarkers. In fact, we can see that recent times Many of these built-in sensors that we already have in our, you know, smartphones and wearables uh, has been successfully used to develop digital biomarkers that can capture different internal physiological and behavioral processes. However, however, there's still gaps. We still lack in mobile sensing mechanism to capture novel variants of digital biomarkers. And more importantly, there is a big data science, data methodology gap that can map so many of these uh, low-level digital biomarkers into what we call early indicators, early syndromic indicators, right? And unless we have these early indicators, we cannot really use it, use some of these technologies for just-in-time intervention or early diagnosis, right? And in my personal opinion, I think much of the digital biomarkers that we that are available based on like uh, with, that has been developed with smartphone and wearables it could be a controversial one, but in my opinion, it's slightly lagging in nature. Uh, and consequently, the type of technology that we can develop is a little bit reactive in nature as opposed to being proactive, right? Let me give an example. In the context of, let's say, um, digital therapeutics in the context of opioid addiction, right? Unless we have this novel variance of data capture mechanism that can capture, right? Uh, physiological data unobtrusively, continuously, uh, while respecting privacy concerns. And unless we have this uh, data modeling technology that can lead us to these early indicators, in this particular case, for example, craving, right, a model for craving, we cannot really use it for data inter in informed intervention. Uh, like, for example, th in this particular scenario, we cannot really offer mindfulness intervention at the right moment and in an optimized fashion, unless we have the other pieces. And fundamentally, this is a data science problem. Now, so far, we have talked about individual level health, right? Person or individual level health. And now if you steer our attention to from individual or personal level health to population or community level health, we'll see a slightly different set of challenges, right? And uh, they're essentially uh, kind of the, the fundamental challenge here is to harness population level syndromic signals uh, with an array of these personal level mobile devices at scale. And this is fundamentally because the ubiquity that I was mentioning earlier, right, the ubiquity of mobile devices does not necessarily guarantee that it can be an effective means for population level uh, uh, kind of signal aggregation. And uh, for instance, if a lot of people, for example, in this 
scenario, if a lot of people are are carrying smartphones and wearables, and unless unless that that is that is the case, right? If, if that is not the case, if not a lot of people perhaps do not have access to that uh, digital technology or do not feel comfortable sharing this data, right? Then what will happen? Uh, the resulting aggregated population level signal uh, will, may not be uh, representative of the underlying you know, syndromic or health signal that, that can be captured, uh, that, that is associated with the community. And consequently, the resulting population level syndromic signal, aggregated signal, will have a low signal to noise ratio. In other words, it is not indicative of the community, right? And this fact fundamentally limits our ability to make data informed, effective community level disease forecasting, just the way we do weather forecasting. And this is also a yet another data science problem. And in, in my research, right, in our research, we try to develop a smart and connected mobile sensor data ecosystem. So a lot of emphasis on ecosystem uh, for sensing early health indicators from individuals and communities at scale for generalizable and accurate predictive analytics supporting early detection intervention. Quite mouthful. Let me simplify this uh, by highlighting the three key terms, which are respectively earliness, scalability, and correctness. And one of the fundamental challenges to develop this so-called smart and connected mobile sensor data ecosystem that can create strike a balance among these three key terms and simultaneously maximize all these three, key, uh, these three, uh, three uh, idea. Let me try to illustrate this idea uh, uh, point uh, with respect to three, in this hypothetical three-dimensional space. And I'm going to play a thought, thought, uh, a thought experiment, right? Uh, so here in this three-dimensional space, we have on the x-axis, we have unobtrusiveness, y-axis, we have correctness, and z-axis, we have earliness. Now let's think of hospital technologies. You can, let's think of all the technologies that, that, that uh, think of fMRI or biologic uh, testing kit like a blood testing or uh, or urine testing. Why would this technology go in this three-dimensional space? Most likely around that uh, orange dot. Why? Because much of these hospital technologies has been designed to be highly accurate in nature, obviously, right? That's very crucial for us to ensure accuracy. However, uh, many of these technologies are associated with the high obtrusiveness and are not uh, kind of conducive for uh, home usage, right? Beyond beyond the clinical realm, it's, it's not really usable. Consequently, the earliness, the ability of this technology to detect early anomaly of health anomaly is fairly limited. And similarly, for the same, same reason, the unobtrusiveness is also fairly limited. In others, uh, these technologies are generally highly ob ob obtrusive in nature. Now let's repeat this thought experiment in the, in the context of mobile clinical questionnaires that many times allows a patient uh, or a caregiver uh, and respond to clinical questions uh, or self-report, right? And, and this, the, the benefit of this te technique is that it, the patient or the caregiver can then self-report in the, in the, in the comfort, from the comfort of a home, right? So now where would this technology go? Most likely around that dot, right? The second dot. Why? Because uh, obviously the unobtrusiveness is better compared to hospital technologies because generally it allows us to, we can still be at, at home while responding and participating in this data capture mechanism. However, uh, the correctness is generally compromised because much of these uh, responses generally tend to be subjective in nature. So. Sometimes the correctness is iffy in this context. Now, if you can't, if you continue this thought experiment in the context of state-of-the-art mobile health solution for personal health, personal health uh, analytics, we'll most likely put it on the other end of this three-dimensional space, right? Uh, why? Because these technologies are designed to be unobtrusive, right? Just, you can wear it, you can arguably wear it for a long period of time. Uh, however, the, due to the limitations of uh, mobile sensing as well as data science methodologies, uh, the, the correctness is heavily compromised, right? And uh, lastly, if we want to use this for to capture data from, I don't know, from, from uh, UC San Diego community, for example, right? Uh, then the, due to the complexity of data collection, 
and due to the due to due, due to the due to the privacy concerns that gen many times uh, rises, right? Uh, I would score the unobtrusiveness much lower if if someone suggests that I'm going to use smartphones or or wearable to collect data uh, from a lo lot of people, right? Uh, from the whole San Diego County, for example. Uh, now, as you can see, there's quite a bit of trade-off that 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 exists in this stadium space, and that the fundamental goal is to create this new mobile health so sensing solutions that uh, for both personal personal population level health analytics that can simultaneously kind of maximize all these dots and pushes it to the to the north, right? Um, and from and that 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 is kind of on a high level that is the goal that is the objective uh, of of our research in the lab and from a research methodological perspective uh, that this research can be divided roughly into these three cycles we develop sensor systems we develop uh, signal processing and machine learning algorithm which will go under signal interpretation and lastly we we implement these algorithms in mobile computing platforms right and essentially this kind of research is highly interdisciplinary in nature and luckily we have seen exponential growth in many of these areas now what is fundamentally important for us is to run a research program that will that will cross the boundary right um, uh, 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 that that exists uh, between this uh, break the boundary uh, among many of these uh, uh, kind of domains and subdomains and with kind of that kind of research philosophy and vision we have been doing our research this kind of highlights a couple of uh, projects that that came out um, and I'm going to today, I'm, as I said, I'm going to provide a buffet style overview. I'm going to focus on two, two primary clusters of projects. At first, I'm going to talk about opioid addiction. So, all right. If you have any question, please feel free to interrupt me or leave, leave those questions in chat. I'm more than happy to uh, do that. All right. Uh, so the, 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 the picture that you can see on the screen right now is a picture, uh, it's a photo uh, taken in a memorial service in Baltimore, Maryland, um, of a person died of drug overdose. Right? Very depressing, uh, but I'm gonna just uh, briefly talk about that. So in fact, uh, in the in the year, in the last 12, in the, in the 12 month that ended in April, 2021, more than 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses as the pandemic at that point spread ac across the country. In fact, at that point, we have observed a 30% increase in drug overdose-related mortality. Uh, and it was the, fir the first time when the drug overdose uh, kind of uh, uh, process the total mortality due to uh, uh, like gun fatalities and car crashes combined, right? Uh, and recent development is not, not better. Like the, the, we can still see the same trend in, in last year. Uh, in the 12 month period, we've observed an overdose death which topped at 112,000. So uh, pretty grim scenarios on, on that front, right? Now, uh, much of this overdose related mortality uh, can be attributed to what we call opioid use. And in order to understand opioid addiction, right, um, we have to at first try to understand this downward spiral uh, uh, of opioid use disorder. Now, at first, what is opioid? Opioid is a class of drug, and many of you might might be fully aware of it. And just just to be to make sure that everyone is on the same page, opioid is a class of drug that binds to receptors in our brain and in our nervous system, and it can provide temporary relief uh, to to recurrent pain. And repetitive use of this drug can give rise to attentional fixation, stress, and negative emotion, and rumination of pain. And which all again encourage reinforcement of opioid use, and uh, it also changes the brain circuitry in different ways. And eventually, the uh, the user may find himself or herself into this downward trajectory and lose control over opioid use and develop full fledged opioid use disorder. Now, as you can see. Uh, Reinforcement of opioid use, in other words, repetitive opioid use is a leading indicator of loss of control over opioid use. And monitoring is essential. Monitoring of opioid use can provide us an early warning mechanism for opioid use disorder, which can prevent misuse and addiction. Now, if you look at the what is out there, what kind of technology is out there, we can find that current state-of-the-art opioid use monitoring system can be roughly divided into these two, two things. 
One is self-report based, which are oftentimes uh, fraught with inaccuracies due to recall bias. It also has this problem of intentional misrepresentation. On the other hand, we have biological sample testing like blood and urine testing, which are fairly invasive, has limited uh, detection window, and does not infer precise time of use, right? So essentially there is no objective measure that exists to passively and continuously monitor opioid use. And we have developed OPTRAC, a wearable-based opioid use tracker with temporal condition attention network. Essentially, uh, this technology harnesses this multimodal physiological time series data uh, uh, from a wristwatch. And uh, we have developed the algorithm, which you call temporal condition attention network. And what it does, is it can tell whether uh, in a in a one hour window whether someone has consumed opioid or not, and if the person has consumed opioid, when what is the precise moment of administration? It can within that one hour, it can also test, tell that. And uh, we ran a study. We've collected approximately five thousand hours of wearable sensor data, capturing both different types of opioid, both intravenous and oral uh, administration. Uh, uh, in hospital and home setting from about 47 participants. And um, and before jumping into modeling, we at first ran statistical analysis and we have observed that statistical, uh, their significant statistical changes are indeed being registered uh, uh, across different modalities between pre and post opioid administration. So in other words, different features would, would have uh, statistical, uh, achieved stat stat statistical statistical significance um, uh, at, 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 at when it comes to differentiating pre and post opioid administration, which is good. It shows that uh, we're on the right track. Uh, in other words, our, our signal is capturing something, right? Uh, we also observed that different features has uh, different tendencies uh, while heart rate variability, skin temperature, and electrodermal activity, which measures essentially sweat gland activity, right? Uh, sweating characteristics. Uh, these related features tended to increase from pre to post, while heart rate and accelerate, accelerometer features, which essentially captures cardiac activity and, and uh, movement, tended to decrease, right? Uh, the, the, the value tended to decrease from pre to post. So in, in other words, we, need, we cannot treat all the different modalities similarly. Uh, we have to specially treat different modalities and capture these unique modality-specific trends. And lastly, uh, Although these features achieve statistical significance, we can see quite a bit of high standard deviation uh, of error bars, right? Uh, which clearly show that linear modeling related, uh, technique may not be amenable. We may need to consider uh, kind of uh, nonlinear kind of data processing techniques. And that's that's inspired us to develop this channel temporal attention, temporal convolution neural network, quite, again, quite mouthful. Uh, I'm gonna sk skip uh, through that, but the, please feel free to check out the paper for, for more details. Uh, but essentially we have achieved a, uh, with the model, uh, uh, it, clearly th this proposed model outperformed many of the traditional machine learning models and we have achieved a, a FON score of 0.8. Um, and in terms of moment prediction, right? Uh, our predicted administration moment were approximately 8.6 minutes on average uh, farther from the actual moment, right? Mean absolute, in other words, the mean absolute error was 8.6 minutes, which is also pretty good. Uh, all right. We also looked into uh, feature importance. I'm not gonna talk about that, but we also actually published, uh, after publishing the first paper, we published a separate paper where mainly we primarily wanted to look at bias. And it was published in NPJ, uh, Nature Publishing Journal, Digital Medicine. Uh, and one of the key highlights was what we found out is that OPTRAC performs better for naive user uh, or opioid naive user. In other words, someone who, is, who has recently started to take opioid, it performs much better uh, compared to someone who has a chronic user of opioid. And, and that, that kind of makes sense because over time people develop tolerance and repeated opioid exposure can be to opioid tolerance requiring a higher amount of dosage to reach a certain effect. So potentially for opioid naive user, the physiological signals are much more pronounced compared to uh, uh, chronic users of opioid. So that's, that's, that, that is a significant bias of our technology. Uh, this was the first paper that was published in 2021. 
uh, Balu Tejagulapali, a PhD student who is graduating in a couple of months. Uh, he, he has led this work and it was a work in collaboration with Stephanie uh, Carriero and Brittany Chapman's lab at UMass, Amher, uh, UMass Medical School. All right, and this model also one of and another benefit of this model is it it it, it could give it it could shed some light into uh, its thinking process. In other words, it could tell us uh, generate some local explanations with gradient based technique. And what we can see that the last row of this figure, as you can see, it tells us what the model is looking at when it's predicting that the the opioid administration happened in the purple or pink vertical dash line, where the actual administration was at the green dash line. I hope you can see here. Uh, so as you can see, the model was predicting somewhat, like prediction was somewhat good. Obviously we lagged the administration prediction, but by a couple of minutes, which 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 is tolerable. But more interestingly, it, it attended to those moments because we, a priori didn't know that when, when is the opioid administration moment, obviously, right? Uh, and it's interesting to see that the 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 white line, the bottom, actually spiked up around that point more, uh, which shows it attended to those changes more, uh, which is quite good. All right. So now, uh, when it comes to working in this area, um, another key challenge is data, right? Uh, label data in the area of substance use disorder, especially label large scale sensor data in in this space, is fairly limited. On the other hand, unlabeled data is cheap and abundant, right? You, if you call, okay, I don't, uh, you can always collect data with an variable where there is no label. So label is, is the key, uh, but that's also hard to achieve, right, to, to, to collect. So now the question, fundamental question is, can you design an artificial self-supervised task, right? It's a machine learning term to learn better representation from large unlabeled mobile sensor data. And by self-supervised task, what I, what I say is that, um, uh, uh, human baby, if you look at uh, us, right, humans, uh, we we can actually process and learn from large scale unsupervised data, right? In our when you uh, when you're small, we observe, we touch, we we feel our surroundings, and we can we can constantly learn from 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 the environment and from some of the interactions that we have. We don't have to necessarily uh, right from the beginning have to have to, uh, uh, have to be taught that this is the this is cat, this is dog, right? So the question, uh, the fundamental challenge here is uh, that we try to tackle is that is it possible to take some large scale un unlabeled sensor data that was collected from maybe some other purposes and repurpose it and pre-train the model to give uh, some knowledge about the signal itself. That, that way it will learn how to even look at the signal, right? So the basic understanding it will develop. So we, we have done that. And another fundamental challenge was that this machine learning model actually fundamentally lacks physics knowledge. It, it basically learns it, you give some input, it, you, you ask it to generate some output and it learns the mapping. It doesn't really have to learn anything. It learns the typical mechanism behind this map. And, uh, and the, then the question is, can you teach it some physics, All right? Can you teach how an opioid once is uh, consumed, how it's metabolized, how it's, it's spread uh, at different parts of the body uh, and, and uh, absorbed by the blood, et cetera, and can that actually boost the performance? It turns out it does. So, and in, in, the, in the area of op opioid, in fact, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity, right? Um, for example, IV opioid are designed to provide immediate pain relief. On the other hand, long acting oral opioid uh, are designed to kind of provide uh, pain relief over a long duration of time, right? So, so the question is by injecting this physics knowledge about how our body metabolizes this drug in the training phase, uh, can we possibly train a much more accurate and potentially more generalizable opioid use detector that will keep learning and adapting as, as in the future, maybe new variants of opioid will come on the market and it will keep learning those traits. Ultimately, it's a pain, it's, it's a drug, it's a pain reliever, right? And uh, in terms of the physics, what we, uh, we, what we have integrated is, is pharmacokinetics. So what it does on a high level, pharmacokinetics uh, is, uh, provides a simple, a simple compartment model and some 
partial differential equation, uh, which is basically its canonical equation to describe how uh, oops, uh, to describe relative plasma drug concentration over time, right? And uh, in order to both run the self-supervised uh, training and in order to train this physics knowledge, uh, we, ha we, have, uh, the, the, we have achieved it in two steps. In first step, we, we have designed a self-supervised task uh, uh, that, that mimics some of the phys physiological changes that would have happened for opioid use. And for these, we have used a large scale data set that is nothing to do with opioid. And then we have, uh, in order to train the model or make the model more mindful about the physics, right? So that it doesn't learn, uh, it always learned physics consistent kind of projections and ideas. Uh, what we have done is we made the model, an intermediate layer of the model, predict the plas uh, plasma drug concentration based on a canonical single compartment model. That way the model, while it's learned, learns to predict a detect opioid administration, and detect the moment, it's also mindful of the dark uh, plasma concentration over time. And the re result was remarkable. Uh, we have found this PK, or in other words, pharmacokinetics informed model outperforms the model that has never seen physics, that does not, is not pre trained on RG before. Uh, and in terms of opioid administration prediction uh, with variable sensitivity in both inpatient and outpatient settings. And as you can see in the inpatient setting, uh, the blue dots are the the basically the the yellow dots, right? The brown dots then uh, has been forced to come closer to the vertical uh, diagonal line, which is desirable in both inpatient and outpatient setting. All right. So in summary, what we have done so far, we've essentially, if you look at the uh, baseline approaches. Right, we can roughly put it in these three-dimensional spaces in those those values. Right, the self-report, both the self-report and, and biological sample testing will be kind of uh, have um, in terms of RDS, it will fail to capture early indi uh, indicators of OUD uh, compared to our proposed approach. Our proposed approach would be much more accurate, uh, and uh, more importantly, it will capture passive and continuous usage trend over time, which which is much valuable when, when, when it comes to, uh, uh, for clinical decision-making as well as self-reflection. Now, uh, opioid use detection is useful, but still it's inadequate when it comes to just-in-time health intervention, right? Uh, to understand it, uh, let's take a look at the addiction loop, right? It start with uh, ex getting exposed to drug use. It leads to generally this drug craving, which in turn may lead to drug seeking behavior, drug administration, and drug euphoria. And basically, the, our brain circuit changes and the addiction loop continues. Basically, next time someone craves, the craving is a little bit more. Uh, the same amount of drug is not enough anymore. So the individual craves for higher dosage, et cetera. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the vicious uh, cycle continues. And one of the most opportunistic moments to break this, this cycle is essentially through craving moment detection. And if you could detect uh, kind of that the individual started to pray for drug, we could, we could then offer just-in-time intervention, right? In the form of mindfulness intervention or uh, CBT and potentially help the individual to break the loop, right? And which is also does not exist on the market. And in the past, we have done some work uh, in the context of cocaine craving, euphoria, and drug seeking behavior prediction with some of our colleagues uh, at Yale Medical School. Um, and we have demonstrated that we actually wearable signals, uh, especially cardiac signals, is really highly indicative of craving. Uh, and it, we, can, we could detect high level of cocaine craving with a FR score of 0 0.083, which is quite uh, encouraging. And more recently, we have replicated a similar study. We just completed a similar study um, for opioid. So, um, uh, and in that in that study, we uh, we have developed a personalized models for stress, uh, pain, and craving prediction. So when it comes to this affective state models around addiction, one of the key challenge is personalization. So because individual is stress stressor or level of pain and level of craving, perceived level of craving might be much different. 
from individual bees stress pain and cramping right so how do you tackle that how do you how do you uh, how do you when it comes to creating a mapping uh, uh, with a wearable sensor right a wearable wristwatch for example how do you tackle that that interpersonal uh, differences right uh, and we have achieved it to what we called uh, learning dynamically learn to branch. Essentially, you can, on a high level, you can think it as, as at first clustering these individuals into different groups, right? Not purely based on demographic signal because that does not work. Uh, but it's a combination of demographic signal, also the wearable signal. We clustered them into different groups. And then by learning the membership of this new individual in, in those group, we could uh, actually effectively uh, get personalize the model and that to give an immense boost when it comes to stress pain and craving prediction with 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 our model uh, and then once we have done that what we have uh, and this is active work uh, uh, currently uh, being prepared to submit but what we're trying to do is uh, is it possible for us to look at an individual's trajectory of stress pain craving with the same model that I just described, right? On the on the blue top, blue in the middle, it's, it's basically the same model. And then is it possible for us to capture the history of an individual's stress pain and craving and by extracting different uh, features, specifically what we have looked at is topological nonlinear dynamical analysis uh, related features, which captures the notion of chaos in the data. Uh, and by also by on the other hand by integrating data like demographics and symptom history and prescription history and also recent affect score is it possible for us to integrate all of the those the wearable data as well as demographics data and uh, via prompt engineering can can we ask a large language model to classify whether the someone is mis uh, uh, has a at high risk of misuse or not right uh, and also, is it possible for us to engineer that, that model, that lar so-called large language model, to generate explanation and reasoning? So uh, let me walk you through what, what are some of the ideas and some of the preliminary results. So the idea is the LLM will get a role, right? Uh, the LLM will, with via prompt engineering, will set that, okay, LLM, you are an affable doctor. What uh, my students found out that if you praise LLM, apparently it works better. I was just very surprised, but <laughs> apparently that is the case. Uh, but anyways, uh, um, it, it set a role for the LLM. It says that, hey, you are an affable doctor specialized in diagnosis, uh, like you're specialized in opioid uh, addiction or opioid uh, misuse, and you must follow certain rules, right? You must consider um, certain factors, um, usage history, prescription, medical record, et cetera, and also then you systematically also take, uh, then we, we, we basically this is, the, this is the rule that the individual, uh, the LLM must follow and then we can provide a particular individual's information. For example, uh, you are an individual patient 70 years old, um, white, or Caucasian, or Hispanic, Latino, and, and uh, education level, et cetera. And then also more importantly, uh, can you provide uh, recent pain, uh, uh, some of this effective scores, right? Uh, what are the, based on wearable signals, as well as the, the chaos features based on wearable features, essentially some form of representation of last five days worth of trajectory of mood uh, or, or affect uh, uh, around stress, pain and craving. And if we send all this information, now the task that we said, hey, you have to tell whether this individual is at high risk of opioid misuse or not. Let me give you an example. So this is the, we have used this chain of thought uh, technique where we have asked this, a series of questions to the LLM around a particular case by, while we provided all this information. And the output essentially looks like this. Uh, the output essentially, say, uh, we, we get that, okay, uh, the risk of misuse is 38.6%. In, in other words, it's not likely to misuse, uh, the, the risk of misuse is less than 50%, which is good. Uh, and also it tells, uh, it gives a summary of its reasoning, right? It tells, uh, uh, based on the patient's information, he's 70 years old, Caucasian male, 
with high level of education. He has been prescribed with morphine, five years old, uh, things like that. It, it basically gives a summary, uh, uh, reasoning why it thinks that uh, the probability is essentially 38.6%. And it also then outlines some of the thoughts. And lastly, more importantly, it gives a conclusion and it, it provides supplementary information in terms of if you, if the LLM, uh, what is LLM's opinion in terms of what additional information could be helpful for the LLM to be a little bit more confident about the prediction, because there's always uncertainty, right? So there, uh, we could potentially use this chain of thought technique with an LLM with prompt engineering to effectively fuse uh, many of this uh, information together. And the performance was encouraging. So we have trained a GPT 3.5 uh, model. We have been looking at it. Uh, so this is again, preliminary results. But what we found out is that it, uh, the, the LLM with just demographics and prescription and symptom information, essentially EHR data, LL, uh, GP, uh, the GPT 3.5 trained on L, uh, H EHR data does not perform very well. So it achieves about a uh, AUC ROC of 0.65. Uh, however, once we send the wearable information, the we observe a significant performance boost uh, of, of about from 0.65 to 0.77, right? So in, in other words, uh, the wearable data are highly informative of opioid misuse risk. LLM can be an effective means of signal uh, uh, means to aggregate information. However, we have to be careful. Uh, it's basically garbage in, garbage out. If you don't provide, like in in particular in our data set, um, an LLM could, did not do a very good job at predicting de detecting this risk when it just received the electronic health information. Can I ask we'll you? Also, yeah, please move on on that one. So yeah. when you're talking about the using the large language model or and and the electronic health record are you using actual electronic health record data and putting it into chat gpt it's a it's a local locally deployed uh version of uh, of an llm so does that yeah, mean actual data but on our server oh so you have control over what's yeah, going on yeah 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 thank you okay. And then we have also explored what is more interesting is that we have also explored uh, some much more compressed models like clinical bird and clinical tiny llama, right? That can be even deployed in a, in a mobile device, essentially, uh, much more in a research constrained environment. And what we found out is that uh, uh, that actually outperformed some of these big, big models, essentially. And um, we achieved, but on every occasion, every time we provided this kind of, again, locally de deployable model, but these compared to the previous model, these models are more amenable to like mobile implementation. Let's say you can put it on your Google home or a mobile device uh, possibly. And, uh, and that way much of the privacy related concept might be somewhat mitigated or somewhat at least, uh, uh, somewhat limited, uh, uh, minimized. And, uh, but in all the occasions, what I want to highlight is that the importance of wearable data. Once we provide some information about wearable data of how the past five days uh, they, they went right to the model, the model started to perform much better compared to the model receiving only, uh, you know, EHR information, health record information. Of these individuals, so on, on. In fact, we have achieved the highest performance with clinical tiny llama, which is, which is we can totally deploy it in, in a smart a smart devices, and we achieved about zero point eight two ROC AUC. All right. So eventually, what we are looking at is uh, this wearable signal can capture trajectories and ups and downs of affects. Uh, the wearable signal can be used to track. Uh, intake events, right? Opioid use intake events. Uh, however, there are also uh, other techniques like cogn cognitive uh, 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 based techniques that can allow an individual to measure uh, attention biases, right? Uh, that uh, we are kind of started to explore. And 
Uh, and these tasks are episodic tasks, essentially with the help of smart devices, essentially this, this task uh, ask an individual to, uh, to essentially uh, play dot prop task, right? While, while wiring a variable. And by, by, by and the dot, dot probe task is not the original version of the dot probe task, for example, those of you who are familiar with it. The version that uh, it, it essentially shows some opioid related pictures, right? Pictures of a syringe, uh, purposefully to, to trigger some scraping related uh, uh, psychopath uh, psych behaviors. And by capturing uh, uh, psychophysiological signals, response signals with the help of a variable, we, we, we could potentially capture this attentional bias related information. And uh, the, uh, what would be in, in, important for us uh, is to come up with techniques to fuse this large scale mobile sensor data from a specific inter intervention episode as well as this passive and continuous recordings. We're kind of starting to look at that. Yeah. And another uh, high level goal is to, to develop this closed loop mobile system, uh, sensing systems that can, again, trigger, detect these craving moments and offer digital therapeutics in the form of different types of mindfulness. And it will be personalized in the sense that it will capture, it will understand which intervention worked and which did not, which variants of mindfulness uh, intervention actually worked with these specific individuals. And over time, it will be tuned to this individual and help this individual to break the addiction loop uh, fastest uh, time. Uh, we're also looking at a large scale data set, currently looking at which contains both civilian data as well as veterans and active duty soldiers. Um, and um, yeah, um, so I think that's pretty much it. The, all I had about opioid addiction. I know we are running out of time. <laughs> uh, Kevin did warn me that uh, you have too many slides. Uh, I'm going to briefly, maybe <laughs> if I may, sh should I open up a question for, for yeah, this I part? Think about, I think it's about yeah. time for questions. Sure. I think that's sure. great. Yeah. Um, let's uh, stop let's sharing your screen. Yeah. Sure. And yeah, I'd like to open it up to questions. If you're comfortable turning your video on, feel free to do that. First of all, thank you so much for your, the work that you're doing is just incredible. And, you know, I'm thinking about you're developing these technologies, you're testing them, you know, you're put it, and I, and I guess you eventually will deploy them into healthcare or, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a couple questions. The first one was when you were talking about doing some personal level inferences based on individual level data, um, Typically, the pathway would be is that you enroll people in a study, you have a process of informed consent, and then you you were talking about these population based analytics, right. and you know you were showing the train station and how you can start picking up these yeah. signals and making population health um, assessments. And I re recall putting in a DARPA proposal many years ago, and. One of the ideas was to use a Fitbit to monitor the health signal of San Diego County and to identify, you know, spikes in in temperature, um, in mobility, and using right. that to predict onset of the flu. And so I have to go get some tea because I'm about to cough. But I wanted okay. to ask about like when doing those kind of population health. Yeah analytics, what are the ethical issues that you would think through? And I'm just in the other room getting some water. Sure, 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 please. Uh, yeah, I think I think this is, this is uh, that, that part I, I didn't have time to present. <laughs> I had too, too many slides. Uh, but uh, we have done very similar things. Uh, I think it's, it's challenging, right? Collecting data, in my opinion, over a long period of time with, with variables, like at, at the county level, I do, I'm not convinced that we're there yet. Like, I don't convince that this will be a sustainable uh, mechanism to collect epidemiological data. First of all, due to, uh, first of all, people, I mean, there's like variables are, are obviously spreading, but a lot of times variables, people stop wearing variable after the novelty effect wears off, right? It's documented in the literature. People don't doesn't want to wear it. You have to ultimately recharge. Obviously, things are getting better. I mean, the charging time is less these days, and it works for a week, um, so that that helps. But there are significant concerns with uh, data, like data sharing issues, right? 
you cannot just uh, uh i think that that is one of the major concerns that we have there and that generally prevents us from collect like even if we're successful at recruiting i don't know 100 individuals in uh, san diego county that is not going to be representative of the community level signal so what we have done and if i may present two slides and that is that was exactly what i was going to present uh is this right uh the idea was can we we have in the lab we have uh created these sensor boxes these boxes essentially captures like it's based on the chip right low, low cost relatively low cost uh uh it has raspberry pi which is 20 bucks microphone array is 20 bucks Thermal camera a little bit expensive, uh, but we get, that's dispensable. We can get rid of it. Uh, and local storage. So the idea was, can you put these boxes uh, that run some uh, kind of real-time analysis of, uh, of the acoustics of specific location, not everywhere, but specific public spaces. Uh, like think about bus stops, think about uh, maybe a, a classroom or a cafeteria uh, uh, or even even public buses. And what it does is it does not look at speech, first of all. It, it does not even analyze the speech. Uh, it primarily looks at non-speech because speech is not really informative for us. Like it's not interesting for us. Uh, from a syndromic perspective, what we wanted to do is we wanted to count coughs. So what these boxes do it boxes essentially deployed in in uh, Amherst in Massachusetts in several hospital waiting rooms uh, over a seven month long deployment and this was pre pandemic so nothing to do with covid we started this uh, in the context of influenza uh, um, and we collected uh, a lot of data and it turns out that this cough number of cough per person time is a highly indicative indicator of influenza dynamics in the small, you know, UMass Amherst college town, right? It's a small, it's essentially college town. Uh, and I think, I think technologies like this, that, that would be, you know, uh, that, that does not, that is not dependent on active use of a lot of people because other things do not work, right? Uh, it's hard to convince that you have to add this 24 seven for ever, right? Uh, uh, and as opposed to that, if we create this sense of boxes that does not rely on active participation from the user, but it can capture these specific syndromic signals, not everything, not uh, privacy sensitive things, like number of cough count. And we are not even interested in who coughed and when cough, things like that. We All we're doing is aggregated cough in this, in this part of the, I don't know, in this, in this cafeteria, right, uh, our dining hall, uh, a normal time, I hear, I don't know, five cough per person time, person an hour, and suddenly I'm hearing 20 cough per person hour. Something must be brewing under the skin. So, so I, I, I'm yeah. with you on this, but I, I guess, you know, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Sure. sure. He has a question, but I think about, you know, the IRB approved it and I'm in this room. Did I consent individually or did they somehow waive consent because it's not considered invasive? And I would be so upset if somebody was recording my coughs because they could be yeah. recording my voice. And voice is very interesting. Even if it's not to you right now, it's very telling yeah. of self. That's true. So That's I'm, true. I'm thinking about like, at what point do we assume somebody doesn't need to consent when... They truly do. And how do we start to elevate awareness of what these sensor technologies are picking up? And I'm going to stop there because I do want to let Brian ask a question. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my quick response is I, they did elevate. Like we didn't have to ask for individual consent because we did not we did not record anything. We 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 all it, it's a spreadsheet. It captured number of cough per person hour. So something like that, like an aggregated measure. Uh, we did not record any data whatsoever, like no underlying like acoustic signals or anything like that. Uh, so that was the goal. And they did wave. So UMass IRB did allow it to pass. And I, and I, I worry about IRBs yeah. not understanding the data. That's true. Yeah, That's that is thing. also true. Yeah. Hey, that, I, I, we did a lot of it. It took a while. <laughs> There's a lot of back and forth. So I don't, uh, I'm not, I, I'm convinced that they have taken careful consideration that did all the consideration, but uh, but that was the case for us. Uh, we did not, uh, they waived the individual consent uh, 
part of the IRB. Yeah. Well, my, my question actually, I, I guess, tangents off of Camille's yeah. question, which is, um, you know, we we're talking about IRBs because we're here in academia. Um, in my view, I, I kind of go beyond there and think about the real world and the ultimate IRB is the, the public and what they're willing to let recorded and their understanding of recording even numbers of coughs might veer into kind of privacy for them. Everyone has an individual uh, threshold, right? Sure. And so as an epidemiologist, my question is, um, we can build these models in academia in these very controlled settings where we have a stark, you know, black and white, you know, opioid, no, non-opioid, yeah. yeah. and we can make a distinction there. Yeah. But when we go into the real world, um, there are all these other biases, right? The people that are, there could be other influences that we didn't check for that could Perfect. lead to similar signals and give us false positives. Yeah. Um, there could be uh, selection bias where, you know, we're getting a different crowd of people who are uh, consenting to getting their um, their data uh, collected. Um, so I'm kind of thinking, what are your thoughts of like, how do we move forward to get from academia to something that is usable? How do we test that? How do we validate it? Right. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's a tough question. <laughs> it's a very complicated, uh, tough question, but just let's, yeah, let's exchange some ideas, right? Like that's the whole purpose of this meeting. So I think, uh, I acknowledge that this digital technologies are, first of all, it's, it's fraught with problems. Like, uh, it's also like the the threshold that you mentioned. It varies across maybe cultures. It it, it might vary across different groups of populations, uh, like younger population versus elderly individual population. It might be different. So it's also hard to measure. So I think first of all, I think uh, my answer would be we need to perhaps going forward. I think there will be more information about or more information will be available about digital. Uh, sensors like mobile sensors, digital technologies, digital health solutions, and some of these capabilities. And I think as a researchers, we need to make it much more, much more available for the public to form their opinion. I, I think the information is not there, first of all, right? I don't know what Google uh, Home is doing or Amazon Alexa is doing. I've heard from a friend who works at, uh, uh, I don't know if I should say it here, but uh, that they're they're putting radars in some of this TV and things like that, or, or sonar system, right? So that they could count how many people are there and things like that. But anyways, um, so yeah, I think through education, first of all, or making the information more available to the public would be first step. And, and uh, workshops like this would be amazing. Like if you could do just maybe bigger version of this, right? Um, like more exchanges, uh, stakeholder meetings, uh, more exchange of ideas essentially would be needed. On the other hand, uh, as the, the, the tech companies has huge responsibilities, like uh, they need to make, as they're, they're changing their, their, the, the, uh, the timeline has accelerated quite a bit, right? Like uh, rapid, like the, the event becoming more and more rapid and rapid. So I think, they, it's their responsibility to disclose information uh, in a much more transparent manner, which is probably not there yet, in my opinion. So I think through education and through making this information more available, maybe the public can better inf make better informed decision. Perhaps. Thank you, thank you for that because yeah. I mean, that, that ties back into what why we're doing cultivating conversations. It's to get our own research community talking to one another. And, and in the future, you know, we have these recorded so people can come and watch them and, and use them for different kinds of training. But encourage your lab to come next time. Encourage your friends to volunteer to speak. If others here have people that they'd like to have come and speak at, at one of our upcoming Cultivating Conversations, please volunteer. And with that, I, I need to say thank you. And I really appreciate your time, your effort, your, your thoughtfulness about this. And Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so 